Hello all, and welcome to uh, my video, Let's Read, A Brief Illustrated Guide to Understanding Islam. Um, so the purpose of these two videos is to give um, a what I like to think of as a sceptical lay reading of this book. Um, that is, I'm not an expert in a lot of the matters that will be touched on in this book, um, and I suspect that most people who read it won't be either. And so my goal here is simply to provide a somewhat sceptical view of and to ask to examine the claims made in this book. Um, uh, I'll be splitting it over two videos so that each video doesn't get too long. Um, and if we look into the book, basically the book is made up of three chapters. The first chapter is um, some evidence for the truth of Islam. Um, chapter two is some benefits of Islam. And chapter three is general information on Islam. Now, as a sort of sceptical reader, I'm not particularly interested in chapter two, which is the benefits of Islam, or chapter three, the general information on Islam. And so I'm not actually going to be covering it in this video series. Um, what I will be doing, though, is covering all of chapter one, which is some evidence for the truth of Islam, because to my mind, that's the crucial part of this. And um, if the evidence stacks up, then maybe I'll look at the other two chapters. Now, if you want to read along, um, with me. Uh, you can actually read this entire booklet online at www.islam-guide.com. Um, so, let's get into it. So, well, as I say, we're going to cover chapter one. Um, chapter one is made up of seven sections, uh, numbered one through seven. Um, and chapter uh, section one is by, is almost, well, actually it's more than half of the entirety of the chapter. So this video I'm probably going to get through, hopefully, section one. Um, so section one is called the scientific miracles in the Holy Quran. And so the, let's get into it. So the idea presented here is that um, according to this book what Muslims believe about the Quran is that um, God revealed his divine word to Muhammad via the angel Gabriel. That is the angel Gabriel appeared to Muhammad um, and spoke God's word directly to Muhammad. Now, Muhammad was illiterate, and so he memorized these words. He then dictated them to his companions, who memorized them and wrote them down. Um, and the, according to this book, it is widely believed by, uh, by Muslims that the Quran itself is completely 100% accurate. So although there was this memorization and repeating and memorization and writing uh, process, that the... According to this, um, ev once every year and twice in the last year of Muhammad's life, the angel Gabriel appeared again to the Prophet Muhammad to review what had been written in the Quran and to ensure that it was completely accurate. Um, it is also believed by, according to this, that um, from the time it was written down, it was regarded as holy scripture and as such was um, copied with complete accuracy. That it was in, so many people um, believed it to be of such holy um, status that lots of people would memorize portions of it or the whole of it and that, that ensured that it was transmitted reliably all the way down to us. Um, the other part of it is that the things I'll be reading in here are not actually the Quran. Um, the Quran, according to the dictates of Islamic um, belief, is only when it's in Arabic. So the divine word of God was in Arabic and that anything else is a translation of the Quran and that we need to bear in mind that that is not actually the Quran. So the they hold it seems according to this book um, the literal word of God is you know is perfect and is um, completely you know of divine authorship but that's only the Arabic version um, but that's only when it's in Arabic so the version I'll be reading here is a human translation of it and therefore is possibly uh, in error that said um, that's the version that's presented to me and that's the version that seems to be believed to be basically not in error although with the humble possibility so. Quote about the scientific miracles from, and I'm going to quote here from um, a brief illustrated guide from the book, um, and it says, "The Quran, which was revealed 14 centuries ago, mentioned facts only recently discovered or proven by scientists. This proves without doubt that the Quran must be the literal word of God, revealed by him to the Prophet Muhammad, and that the Quran was not authored by Muhammad or by any other human being." It is beyond reason that anyone 1400 years ago would have known these facts discovered or proven only recently with the vast equipment and sophisticated scientific methods. This seems to be the crux of this whole section, um, is the idea that the 
scientific information revealed in the Quran is of such a advanced nature that it could not possibly have been written by Muhammad or any other human being in that time. Um, and therefore, when we see these scientific facts that we've only just, some of which have only just been verified um, empirically, that we have no other choice but to conclude that this, that the Quran must have been divine, divinely authored. Now, there's actually, I think there's actually a few problems with this. So, first of all, this is a sort of an argument for ignorance. Even if it was true that there's no way that Muhammad or any other human being in, you know, 1400 years ago could have written this, could have known these scientific facts, um, it still is unsupported, the idea that therefore it must be divinely authored. There are several other possibilities. Um, it could be that our knowledge of people 1400 years ago was completely wrong. It could have been... Um, like chariots of uh, chariots of the gods, it could have been that an advanced alien race had been providing this information. Um, there are several other possibilities of um, other supernatural beings that could have. I mean, this could be the word of Satan. Um, that's one possibility that would explain why the scientific miracles are in there. So the scientific miracles alone are not going to prove that the Quran was divinely inspired. Um, you're going to need more than that. But it could could prove that the book was not of human authorship, and that is an important first step that you're going to need. Now. The second thing we're going to have to look out for here is that we're actually going to have to confirm that this kind of subject of knowledge could not possibly have been written down by people of the time. That is, that it is actually beyond. Um, and when you think about this, as a, somebody who's sceptical, so if you're not, to anybody who's watching this, if you are not a Muslim, then you're probably not going to have any dramas um, envisaging the kind of things you're going to want to see in the Quran to convince you that it is actually a miraculous book. Um, if you are a Muslim who's watching this, then try and think about this in terms of a religion that you don't believe in. So consider Mormonism. So if a Mormon says to you, oh look, what Joseph Smith has written, you know, is written in the Book of Mormon by Joseph Smith um, that was inspired by the angel Moroni, um, and it's perfectly scientifically accurate and, you know, that'll convince you of its divine origin, um, what kind of evidence are you going to want to see in the Book of Mormon before you're convinced? And that's probably the kind of evidence I'm going to want to see in, in, the, in the Quran before I'm convinced. And the kinds of things I'm thinking about are things that are going to be absolutely staggering. So perhaps if we open up the Quran and in somewhere in there, there is Schrodinger's equation for the wave equation from quantum mechanics. If that's in there, and it's clearly in there, and it's not some metaphor or some sort of poetic passage, but it's clearly stated the terms of the equation and how they link together, that would be pretty damn miraculous, and I would have no better explanation. Um, than that it came from somewhere that it was not of human origin at the time 1400 years ago. Um, so I'm going to be looking for something like that. Maybe nothing quite as staggering as that or as and, uh, sort of sticking out like that, but something pretty damn convincing. Um, I'm not going to want to hear the kinds of things that Christians often bandy about, um, which are sort of vague things that if you read them in one particular way seem to suggest that they link up with what science has recently discovered. Um, this would be particularly telling if, before science has come along and confirmed it, if people were asserting this is what the Quran, the Quran said. So if at the time that Muhammad wrote it down, or even you know hundreds of years afterwards, people had said, "Oh look, we read in here it says something about how um, you know time and space are actually uh, four-dimensional space-time," and everybody else was saying, "Oh no, that's, that doesn't make any sense. Newton's shown that that's not right," and then later we discovered that actually that is correct. Uh, that would be pretty telling. But to get it to the point where we read these parts metaphorically and they don't seem to suggest anything scientific at all, and then after the science comes along and says, oh, look at this, um, we now know about spa four-dimensional space-time, somebody looks back and goes, oh, that's what the Bible was saying all along. Um, that's not really a prediction, and that's not really getting it right. Um, that's us looking back on the text and putting what we already know into it. The last thing I want to say about why this argument fails, well, quite might likely fire, fail is the sharpshooter fallacy. So we have to be sure that not only are we looking at the successes of the Quran, but we have to also weigh that against any possible failures. So when people say that the Bible has all these miraculous sort of predictions, you also have to count all the predictions that didn't come true. And if it turns out that on average it's not doing much better than chance, then it doesn't matter that it's got successes because you could have got those successes by dumb luck. Um, if the book contains nothing but successful predictions that could not have come about any other way, that's quite telling. So, that aside, let's 
So that's what the problem is with saying that this book, because it has scientific you know, predictions in it that came out to be true, um, therefore it's divinely inspired. That's the problem with that argument. Let's get into actually looking at the substance that is delivered. So, this is chapter one, section one, part A. The Quran on human embryonic development. And this is a quote from the Quran. We created man from an extract of clay. Then we made him as a drop in a place of settlement, firmly fixed. Then we made the drop into alaka, leech, suspended thing, and blood clot. Then we made the alaka into mudka, chewed substance. Quran 23, 12 to 14. Okay, so first up, we've got a bit of an issue here. Um, so the suggestion in the book here is that the this passage of the Quran is telling us something literal about human embryonic development, but it starts off with the idea that we created man from an extract of clay. Now we know that to be literally false. Um, man was not created from an extract of clay. Um, and therefore, right off the bat, we have to say that the first sentence is metaphorical, while simultaneously claiming that the subsequent sentences are literal. Um, that seems a little bit like special pleading to me. Um, so first off, this is not particularly compelling, but then let's get into it. So further on in the book, it says that what is being said here is that the um, external appearances of the embryo goes through several stages as described in this um, text from the Quran. Um, and so we have several images in this, uh, I'm gonna show you. So first of all, we have an image of a human embryo, um, which is what they say is in a, the alaka stage, um, and here's a leech. And so the claim is that they look similar. Okay, next time, next on. Now we have an image of the human embryo in another part of the alaka stage um, in the uterus, and it's claimed that basically it's a suspended thing. Um, and next one we have um, is, uh, here we go, diagram, um, this is again in the alaka stage, but in the blood clot part, um, and they're saying that this, well, it's a diagram, but it, the, the embryo at this point appears to be like a blood clot. And lastly, we have it, uh, have an image of the embryo in the mudka stage, um, compared with a piece of chewing gum, i.e. a chewed substance. Okay, so is this clear-cut case of a miraculous, a scientific you know, prediction that is miraculous in the Quran? Well, no. Um, the text itself actually um, acknowledges that ancient peoples or people um, before the Quran was written in the 16th, in the 6th century or so, um, that ancient people did have basic knowledge of embryology. That is, they understood that embryos developed within the woman. Um, particularly noted in the book is um, Aristotle and his work on chicken embryos. Now, they say, oh, well, he had a different model and a different sort of understanding of stages. He didn't really describe them. Well, fair enough. But that at least suggests that basic ideas of embryology um, were known at the time. Uh, it's also po quite possible, and I'm pretty sure, that ancient people had knowledges of various bits of embryology through miscarriage and from examining miscarriages. Um, it hardly to me seems like a huge leap to go from seeing miscarriages, chicken embryos, etc., to describing embryos as similar to leeches, blood clots, chewed substances. Um, that to me doesn't seem like a sort of a, a massive leap that requires divine inspiration or, or divine uh, knowledge. Um, secondly, the other part of it is that um, the claim here is that the external appearances of the embryo are similar to these things. Um, and that's hardly a stunning scientific insight. Um, to simply tell us that this is what this, the embryo looked like is to miss most of the point of embryology, which is actually about how does the embryo develop? Um, what, is, what is the actual functioning that's going on inside it? Not as what is it, external appearance. It's external appearance is the, possibly the very first step after you've worked out that there are such a thing as embryos, is what do they look like? But then that's only a small step towards actually understanding embryonic development. And so the idea that simply describing how it looks is some kind of stunning scientific insight that was not possible at the time, to me doesn't really stack up. Um, now they quote uh, from a guy called Keith L. Moore about embryology. Now clearly, he's clearly qualified in the field. I had a look into this guy, he actually exists and he has all the qualifications that are attributed to him, so thankfully that's much more accurate than a lot of the uh, 
Christian creationists. Um, and he's clearly, clearly qualified to talk about human, human embryonic development. Um, but if what he's basing his, his assertions that the Quran is divinely inspired in its embryology, if he's basing it on, these, on the verse that's been quoted, the verses, he, he's an idiot. Um, either he's basing it on something that they haven't put in here, or he's an idiot in that respect. And even, it might sound arrogant to me to say that, but I don't think anybody reading that one verse could possibly get much embryology out of it. Okay. So, part B, the Quran on mountains. Um, so again, we have a verse from the Quran here. Have we not made the earth as a bed and the mountains as pegs? Quran 78, verses six to seven. So the idea here is that the, um, the earth is like a bed and the mountains are like pegs uh, holding the earth in place there. Now there's another um, Quranic quote as well that they use in this section, uh, and it is as follows. And he has set firm mountains in the earth so that it would not shake with you. Quran 16 verse 15. Okay, so the basic idea, well, the, the whole idea of what they're saying here is that the, as I say, that the, the ground, the earth, is like a bed or is laying across the uh, surface and that the mountains are like pegs holding it in place so that it would not shake with you. Now, here's the thing. They, they've got some nice diagrams there that show that um, the rock that makes up mountains not only extends upward into the mountain but also extends down into the, I guess it's the mantle. My geology is not great. Uh, yes, down into the mantle. Um, and so that makes it look like a peg if you take a cross section. Um, this kind of misses the point though because the Again, it's like it's su the superficial appearance might be of, of a peg, but the actual function of it is not. What's happening with the mountains is that most mountains are, or many mountains, all mountains, are formed when um, tectonic plates are pushing up against each other. And what happens is the, the rock um, at the boundary layer is pushed and compressed, and when it can't compress anymore, it folds its way upwards into mountains. Um, at the same time, the same mountains are pushing down into the ground to create pegs, and due to the nature of, well, the physics of it, the weight of the mountains, etc., etc., is it will push down a lot deeper than it pushes up. Now, this is not the same as a peg. Um, if you can imagine a mountain being a peg, that would be as if it was a single chunk of rock that was forced down to hold things in place. This is not what's happening. This is more like... Um, well, this is more like water being sprayed at each other and flowing up like this. Um, the second thing is, and here's a great picture I got of earthquakes. Now, if you look at where the earthquakes are across the world, where they're most prevalent, um, two things. So along we've got like the mid-oceanic uh, ridges, that's where the plates are moving apart, etc. Um, but also, there's a huge number of earthquakes along mountain ranges. If you look at where the Himalayas are, if you look at where the Rockies are, if you look down South America, if you look through Japan, these are where massive mountain ranges are, and these are also where the earthquakes are. Why is that? Well, because we know earthquakes occur generally, often occur along um, plate boundaries, and that's also where mountains occur, due to the, that's how mountains are formed. Um, so this whole idea that the setting the mountains firm in earth so that they would not shake you, that the Quran is asserting that um, somehow the mountains are preventing of earthquakes is actually quite wrong. It's not just a vague kind of um, not particularly impressive, but it's actually incorrect. Um, now, I'm not a geologist, but this seems to be what the geology is telling us. So, okay, so, so far, zero from two. Let's have a look at part C. The Quran on the origin of the universe. So the first Quran, the quote from the Quran we have is, Then he turned to the heaven when it was smoke. Quran 41.11. Now, without any context, I want, to, I want to ask you, what the hell does that mean? He turned to the heaven when it was smoke. Um, the text is suggesting that <laughs> smoke here is actually meant to be uh, the massive gas clouds uh, that we call nebula and such things in the universe. So what my limited understanding of cosmology would tell me that before planets and stars formed, essentially matter was spread out in uh, the form of hydrogen. Um, I'm not sure if there was anything else there, but certainly no, none of the heavier, heavier elements, so mainly just hydrogen in these massive gas clouds, um, and that under the, for, under the 
force of gravity, they would then coalesce into stars and planets, etc., etc. Um, and that this thing of referring to the heaven when it was smoke is referencing that. Now, I'm not sure if I have to point this out, but that is the most vague of statements I can imagine. You can absolutely interpret it. You can look back now that we know about nebula and interpret it in that manner. But certainly, I don't. I would be very surprised if anybody in 1000 AD was reading the Quran and going, "Oh, look." What it's talking about is this, the state of the universe before planets were formed or before stars were formed. Everything must have been hydrogen gas. Um, that, to me, is a very long draw, bow to draw. Next, Quran, next um, quote from the Quran. Have not those who disbelieved known that the heavens and the earth were, once, were one connected entity? Where then we separated them. Quran 21.30. So the idea here is that... Um, According to, the, according to the book, is that um, the Quran is saying that essentially everything in heaven, in the heavens and the earth, were once one sort of connected entity, that is, they were made of the same stuff. So that which formed the earth was the same as that which formed the heavens. Now, leaving aside that heavens to a modern cosmologist would probably refer to more or less empty space-time, um, that's not quite true. Um, if we leave that aside, even the idea that heavens and earth were created of the same stuff, you know, is hardly groundbreaking scientific um, thought. It's a bit too vague to be telling us anything particularly useful. But also, it sits nicely and completely uh, in with other creation type myths or religious creation myths of the time and previously. Um, even before the Old Testament story of Genesis, where um, God separated you know, the heavens from the earth, and it was about this separation of stuff between um, separating the waters from the waters and things like that. Um, that is a fairly typical creation-type myth, as far as I can tell. The idea of separating this from that is a very clear sort of idea. So the idea that once they were connected, but then, you know, God separated them, um, doesn't, to me, jump out as being a scientifically profound idea. And that's it on the origins of the universe. So that's a bit of a wash as well. Part D, the Quran on the Cerebrum. So here the idea is that um, the Quran contains stunning scientific knowledge about the brain. And the quote from the Quran goes, No, if he does not stop, we will take him by the Nasea, front of the head, a lying sinful Nasea, front of the head. Quran 96, verses 15 to 16. So the idea here is, oh, what's that mean? Well, so there's an, uh, I assume, an Arabic word, Naseya, there, which is being translated the front of the head. And the idea there is that um, the front of the head, the Naseya, is what's being attributed to as being lying and sinful. And so what is claimed in this book is that that's a fairly stunning insight. The idea that a portion of your brain, um, the front of the head, um, is the part that is lying and sinful. Um, rather than attributing it to just the person in the whole themselves. Now, I don't actually know any Arabic. I don't know how accurate that translation is. I don't know whether front of the head is actually going to be translated quite nicely to the what they call in the book the prefrontal area. Um, but on the face of this, this actually started to seem like relatively interesting stuff. Um, if this was an accurate translation of the me intended meaning of the Quran, that the our lying and sinful nature, as it were, or decisions, lay within a particular portion of our brain, that's actually a pretty good falsifiable hypothesis. And if it turns out to be true, that would be pretty good. So what does the evidence say? Well, I did a little bit of scouring around, and I've done a little bit of neuroscience in my past, and I was pretty sure this was going to turn out to be pretty bogus. And it turns out to be true, because here's the thing. Here's the thing we know about neuroscience, the sort of state of play, is essentially... We have some vague ideas, we have some broad general ideas about kinds of tasks that our brain does, which seem to be located within particular areas of the brain. Now we know that that's also fairly plastic, we know that certain parts can cover for other parts and that it's different across different people, um, but we have a general correlation that this area seems to be involved in these kind of things, like, like remembering things or imagining something or moving your right hand. Um, these seem to be, we can, the state of knowledge is that these seem to be localised to particular areas within the brain. Um, fair enough. Now, interestingly, 
being li lying or acting sinfully is not something that we could actually say lies within it because lying is not a particular task that the brain does. Uh, lying is a relatively complex behaviour. It involves um, speech generally, or perhaps only written word. It involves cr the creation of a lie, so you have to make something up. It generally involves remembering things, i.e. remembering what the truth is. Um, it requires some balancing of cognitive load, so um, holding these competing ideas within your mind at the same time. That requires coming to a decision to lie. Um, and these various bits are, there's various bits of the brain involved in all of these things. And it's not just the front of the brain. So the best you could say is that the front of the brain is involved in things like foresight, so predicting the outcome of your actions. It's involved in decision making. It's involved in um, cognition, so conscious thought. And yes, that will be involved in lying and being sinful, but it will also be involved in telling the truth and not being sinful. And so while this seemed like it could be a kind of a promising claim, it's not true, unfortunately. Oh dear, none from four. Okay, part E, the Quran on seas and rivers. So here we go, we have a quote from the Quran. He has set free the two seas meeting together. There is a barrier between them. They do not transgress. Quran 55 verses 19 to 20. So the idea here is that there is a barrier between the two seas and they do not intermingle. And the evidence presented here is they look at the Atlantic Ocean and the Mediterranean Sea and it turns out that according to this the salinity of the, the Atlantic and the salinity of the Mediterranean Sea is um, different, and so where the waters mix at the mouth of the Mediterranean, um, they don't just mix in a, a um, clear-cut way. So what you don't, so according to this, what you don't get is just a straightforward Atlantic salinity, Mediterranean salinity with gradations. What you have, if as anybody you've seen, if you mix, if you pour milk into your cup of tea, what you notice is it doesn't just go nicely white, but the milk blobs into the tea and then diffuses out into it. And that's essentially what happens whenever waters of liquids of different characteristics mix. Is there isn't a the mixing process is not one of just simple um, diffusion into it. Uh, if there's any kind of turbulent forces of tides and things like that. Um, that said. To say there's a barrier between them and they do not transgress is actually literally incorrect. There is no barrier. There may be, I guess, a boundary layer. That is, um, you can point to, here's the salinity of the Atlantic, here's the salinity of the Mediterranean, and these are distinct. And where they meet, um, you know, they might not be a very smooth gradient between it. But to say it's a barrier implies something quite different to that. Um, and to say they don't transgress is not right. I mean, the waters do mix. The salinity does um, cross over and balance out in their mixing zone. It's just that it's a complicated, like pouring water into, uh, pouring milk into your coffee. Um, eventually, the mixing does actually happen. Um, and secondly, even if it was, if we take it on its most generous, to say that it is quite an interesting phenomena that the waters don't just mix nicely, that there can be this boundary layer between them. Um, you can actually look online and you can see pictures of this. You can see pictures of people on boats where there is a, looking at the ocean, where there is a clear boundary between waters, between two different, obviously different sort of salinity perhaps, I'm not quite sure, but there's an obvious boundary. To, so to say that this was some kind of divinely inspired, when somebody could have gone out on a boat and seen it for themselves, um, it hardly takes some kind of the word of God to tell us this. This is something we could have seen. Um, empirically, and given how well travelled the Mediterranean was at that time and previously, it's hardly surprising that this idea of the waters not there being a boundary between them. Um, yeah, I'm not surprised. But there's another quote from the Quran. He is the one who has set free the two kinds of water, one sweet and one palatable, and the other salty and bitter, and he has made between them a barrier and a forbidding partition. Quran 25 verse 53. Again, we're talking about a barrier between two waters. He says water and uh, a forbidding partition. Now, the way that this book interprets that um, is to talk about estuaries, where you have fresh water coming from a, a river, say, and you have the salt water of the sea, and you have some kind of um, mixing zone. And I'm actually quite lucky here. I live in a 
city where the river, um, for a good 10 kilometres from the sea, the salt from the sea sometimes comes up a good 10 kilometres into the river, and at other times when the water is the fresh water is flowing, um, it'll be almost entirely fresh water all the way out to the sea. So we see this kind of salt and fresh water mixing all the time. Um, and the evidence they give here is the idea that there are zones of so you have, say, 33% salinity at the sea, you have 0% salinity of fresh water, and you have zones of decreasing salinity, whichever way you look at it. Um, I actually think they're right, but to call that a barrier and a forbidding partition, to me, seems absolutely wrong. There is no forbidding partition between them. There is um, a nice gradient, as you would expect from mixing. Um, and to call that a barrier is wrong again. Again, the best you could claim is there's a boundary, but it's not a barrier. It doesn't stop them from mixing. Um, all it does is that when they hit each other, they don't immediately flatten, um, that they slowly mix. So I don't find this particularly compelling, especially when, assuming they have estuaries in the Middle East, you could tell this just by walking, going out in a boat and drinking the water and tasting the water at each thing. You could see the separation zones between the fresh water and the salty water. This is hardly uh, needed to be the word of God. Part F. The Quran on deep seas and internal waves. A quote from the Quran. Or, the unbelievers state, is like the darkness in a deep sea. It is covered by waves, above which are waves, above which are clouds. Darkness is one above another. If a man stretches out his hand, he cannot see it. Quran 2440. Okay, so what are they trying to claim here? Well, first of all, they want to say that it um, must be divinely of divine uh, origin to say that the it is dark underneath the ground. Underneath, sorry, underneath the water. So the claim here is that recently, apparently recently in human history, we've discovered that a thousand meters down uh, under the water, there is no light. And therefore, when the Quran says um, darkness of the deep sea, that the deep sea is particularly dark and you can't see a hand in front of, uh, in front of you, um, must be divine. Now, I've got a problem with this. If you go underwater to any appreciable depth, even the depth of a few metres, you can notice how things are darker under the water than they are above the water, that less light is penetrating down and down. If you've been underwater to any... If you think about divers um, in the Mediterranean, perhaps fishermen, um, you know, people even swimming recreationally um, off the coast, if you dive down to, as I say, any reasonable depth, you could people could easily dive down to sort of four or five metres and look up at the surface of the water and you'll see it's darker. It hardly qualifies as sort of divine knowledge to think, to extrapolate from that, that it must be darker and darker the deeper you go down. Um, that said, I, I'm not aware of what the ancient beliefs were about water. I Maybe it's my own cultural sort of, th that I'm projecting onto it, but I suspect that the idea of it being dark the deeper you go underwater is a fairly natural one that many people would have subscribed to. Um, aha, it doesn't sound to me, it doesn't sound to me like a stunning scientific insight. Um, at best it's saying that water it doesn't provide for perfect transmission of light. Um, and while that's you know useful and it is knowledge, it's hardly the amazing insight I would expect from the author of uh, the universe's existence. Now, the other thing I want to talk about is the waves under the waves. So the quote, as I said, is um, it is in the deep sea. It is covered by waves, above which are waves, above which are clouds. Now it wants to say that the bottom waves must be referring to the waves on the on. Uh, Sorry, the, the top waves, the clouds, and that the top waves must be the waves on the surface of the ocean, and therefore the Quran is saying that there's waves underneath that. And what could that possibly mean? And it turns out that given that if we look at a vertical slice of water in the ocean, you don't get equal salinity or heat or whatever, and so you get boundary layers um, between them, and that those boundary waves will, layers will have waves in them. Um, this is really interesting stuff if you're into that kind of thing. Um, and yes, that's what science told us. But I don't see any reason particularly to interpret the Quran that way. And I don't actually give any good um, evidence. I mean, it seems to me just as likely that the Quran meant that there were clouds, there were the waves of the ocean, and that there were some kind of waves in between. Um, and then it would just be strictly, completely wrong. Um, 
And even if it was right that it was talking about clouds, waves on the surface, and then waves beneath, um, that's hardly surprising either. I mean, where I live, we have what we call rips. We have these very strong um, out currents from the beaches, and we have certainly under experience of underwater currents. Um, it would hardly be a push to describe these as waves. Um, and you'd only have to do a little bit of swimming to be aware of this. Uh, I mean, I'm pretty, I'd be very surprised if our local, if the Aboriginal inhabitants of the land here, who've stretched back for 10,000 years, weren't aware of this. Um, and so, again, it doesn't seem like it has to be divinely inspired or, or the word of God. It could simply be people's experience of swimming. Okay, part G, the Quran on clouds. So, here we are going to claim that the Quran has, has stunning meteorolo meteorological knowledge. Let's have a look at what the Quran says. And I quote, Have you not seen how God makes the clouds move gently, then joins them together, then makes them into a stack, and then you see the rain come out of it? Quran 24, verse 43. I feel a bit like a broken record when I say that, okay, I mean, it goes, they actually devote two and a half, three pages to that, to establishing that that is indeed what rain, the clouds do. And you know what? I'm not surprised. Um, that to me sounds like a fair, fairly reasonable explanation of what some clouds do, that they move gently, join together, for, make into a stack, and then rain comes out of it. Um, and again, it doesn't require massive levels of uh, divine knowledge to understand that. Um, if the people at the time had simply watched the clouds, um, they could probably have gathered that kind of idea. Um, just watching clouds form and watching rain would give you that kind of information, possibly, quite possibly, well within the bounds of human possibility. Um, another quote from the Quran. Another quote from the Quran. And he sends down hail from mountains, clouds, in the sky, and he strikes with it whom, whomever he wills and turns it from whomever he wills. The vivid flash of its lightning nearly blinds the sight, Quran 24:43. So then it goes on to claim that essentially what this is saying is that um, the Quran has successfully predicted that lightning comes down, lightning comes from these sort of uh, mountainous clouds in the sky, and that lightning um, will blind the people with its flash. Um, again, this is not stunning meteorological insight. Um, I'm quite happy accepting that, and I'm pretty sure I could come to the same conclusion had I watched a few storms. Um, that the, the clouds in the sky do seem to be to do related to the rain and the lightning. Um, the part about he strikes with it whomever he wills and turns it from whomever he wills, if that was actually a... if you... It's either fal unfalsifiable in that it doesn't matter who he strikes or who he doesn't strike, it's always going to be who he wills, or it's some statement about... Um, God's judgment of people, at which point we'd actually know that that's false. Um, there doesn't seem to be any pattern in lightning strikes. Um, so yeah, I can't, I don't actually, um, I don't see any particular um, miraculous meteorology in those statements. Ooh, part G. Scientists comments on the scientific miracles in the Holy Quran. So essentially what this section is, um, is quotes from six uh, leading scientists in various things, embryology, uh, astronaut, astronomy, um, genetics, etc., etc., all saying that basically they've read the Quran, it's been pointed out to them the things that it says in the Quran, and they absolutely are spot on with the things that they know about, say, embryology, um, um, geology, etc., etc. Um, and it backs up, basically, these are just um, well-credentialed scientists confirming what's previously presented. And I'll say the same thing as I said about Keith Elmore before, that these people are eminently qualified to comment on these matters. Um, they have all the right qualifications. Um, but if what they're saying is based on the Quranic verses that I've read, and if, they're, if that's all they've got to go on, which I must assume is true, because otherwise why wouldn't you put it in, a book like, in this booklet? Um, then they are, they're speaking as idiots. They're either blinded by some kind of faith, or given that some of them were funded by the Saudi government, um, 
perhaps it was blinded by money. I don't know. I, I don't actually want to impugn their, their um, reputations, actually. Um, but even a layperson can read these verses and see that they are not providing specific, testable scientific hypotheses um, that are outside the bounds of what somebody in the 6th or 7th century could have reasoned themselves to anyway. Um, and so if they are if they are accurately portrayed, if they are, have been accurately quoted in this book, and they honestly think that these, this is good evidence for the scientific miracles in the Quran, then I have to conclude that they are idiots. Um, and that's it for the scientific evidence. Um, now, I don't want to say that there is no good scientific evidence in the Quran, because I haven't read the Quran. Um, I haven't even read the translation of the Quran. Uh, to draw that distinction. I, but what has been presented in this book is underwhelming at best. Um, it is within the bounds of what 6th century people um, could have thought or could have reasoned their way to with imperfect reasoning. I thought the, the brain stuff was potentially compelling, but it turns out it's wrong. The, geolog the geological stuff was wrong. Um, the embryology stuff was, frankly, not particularly convincing. Um, and again, I want to just harken back to what I said in the introduction about what kind of evidence would we need. So to even conclude that the Quran could not have been authored by people, we would have needed really good evidence. Why is that so? Well, because we see these claims a lot. Um, if you wouldn't, if as a Muslim you wouldn't accept that the Book of Mormon was uh, dictated by the angel Moroni, based on vague claims of you know, possibly scientific kind of information in it, then you also need to apply the same standard. Um, as somebody on the outside looking in, it's quite easy to see um, that these claims simply don't stack up. They are not the kind of extraordinary evidence that we would want for an extraordinary claim. And, and that's, I mean, let's keep in mind, this is an extraordinary claim. I mean, the claim made in this book is that the Quran was, is literally the word of God that was spoken to an illiterate person who memorized it and repeated it to his companions, who then memorized it and wrote it down, that it is literally has been kept 100% accurate throughout the 1400 years since, and that it contains, and that it, the pr one of the main proofs, because it's first in the book, so I, I, I assume that means that they think that this is some of the best evidence they've got for accepting that it is the word of God, is some vague passages that you can reinterpret in the light of modern knowledge. Um, that to me is a bit of an indictment on uh, the reason on a bit of indictment on the level of evidence you ha that people have for it being the literal word of God. I think that um, if that's the best that um, one has, then then we can pretty conclusively um, decide that the the Quran is not the word of God. Um, that said, I'm not finished with this yet. <laughs> chapter one has still got there's another half of chapter one to get through, so maybe that's what maybe they put that up front for some other reason. Maybe what's coming next will convince me. Um, who knows? So leave me a comment. Um, I'll answer as many as I can, and I'll see you next time for part two, where I go through the rest of chapter one. Thanks for watching. Bye.